1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let us pray. Lord, I, I uh, come to you this evening, Lord, and, and uh, I have nothing to offer, Lord, but uh, your love and your grace and your mercy, Lord, that you poured out on me, Lord, that I can share with others, Lord. I ask, Lord, you would take these words that are written on these pages, Lord, these lifeless words, and breathe life into them, Lord. Just send them forth, Lord, into the hearts of these, your people. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Back in 1965, they wrote the words to a song that became one of the best-selling songs of, of uh, that generation. They struck a, a responsive chord. They hit the right note, so to speak, when they penned the lyrics that said, What the world needs now is love, sweet love. That's the only thing that there's just too little of. And uh, Burt Bacharach and Hal David wrote those lyrics. Uh, it was performed by uh, Jackie DeShannon, sold millions and millions of records. And it's been recorded by hundreds of artists since then, and they sold a multitude more millions of records, tapes, and CDs. And the message that they proclaimed in that song resonated <laughs> to that generation. And it's true that... Uh, the words that they wrote, that we truly do need love, and also that is the one thing that there is just too little of. And unfortunately, that's also true in the Christian community, in the church of Jesus Christ. Now, although Bert Bacharach penned those words, it didn't work out too well for him because shortly after he penned that song, he and his uh, wife Angie Dickinson, who was a, a former model and an and a, uh, actress as well, uh, they divorced, and Bert moved on to his fifth wife. So he found in his own situation that he couldn't get a grasp on that which he was so uh, articulate in presenting to us as an as a audience. We're going to look at three things this evening in, in here in 1 Corinthians. First of all, of course, everyone knows that 1 Corinthians is, is the love chapter. Uh, if you ask somebody how to define love, they're going to say, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That'll answer all your questions right there. And so we're going to look at three things this evening that pertain to this chapter. First of all, why we need it. I mean, why do we need love in the first place? Can't we just say, you know what, you do your thing, I'll do mine. You know, you don't step on my toes, I won't step on yours, and we'll just go through life that way. Well, that's not what 1 Corinthians tells us, as we're going to see. So first of all, why we need it, second of all, what it is, what the biblical definition of love is, and then thirdly, how, can we can, how we can experience it practically in our own lives. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, there are those who, who think that maybe Paul kind of went out on a tangent when he got here to chapter 13, because it really doesn't fit between chapter 12 and chapter 14. Chapter 12, of course, is, is uh, uh, speaking of the, of the gifts of the Spirit, what they are. And then in chapter 14, how they operate, the manifestation of the, of the gifts. And some think that maybe he meandered a bit here in chapter 13, kind of got off track. But that's not so. This is not an interruption in the discussion of the gifts, but this is actually an application of the discussion of the gifts. It tells us how to apply the gifts and how they are to function and flow within the body of Christ. Let me use a, an Old Testament analogy. Say you, you wanted to go worship the Lord. Say you're 2,000 years ago. And you say, you know what, I want to go to worship the Lord. And so you'd make your way to Jerusalem, and you would find your way to the, to the uh, Temple Mount there. You'd find yourself a Levite and say, look, I, I want to see the high priest because I want to worship the Lord. The Levite would say, well, you know what? He, he's in the holy place. He's interceding for you. And you might think, well, you know what? How do I know that, he, that he's really in there? I mean, how do I know he didn't slip out the back and, and maybe go on vacation or something? How do I know that the high priest is actually in there interceding for me? And the Levite would tell you, just listen. And as you were silent and you listened, you could hear the distinctive ringing of bells within the holy place. We're told by uh, Alfred Edersheim, he spent most of his life studying uh, uh, Jewish culture and also the, the uh, uh, 
application of those into the uh, articles of the temple. And he tells it that those uh, bells rang in perfect harmony when they struck. And the, the uh, uh, definition of harmony in the, in the Webster's Dictionary is the pleasing combination of tones within a chord. It's just the perfect harmony, kind of like our worship group was this evening. Perfect harmony within a chord. And the purpose of those bells was that, that when the priest was in the holy place, people would know that he was in there interceding and ministering. And he was still alive because we're told that if he went in there in an unworthy manner, that God would strike him dead. So you would hear the, the harmonious sound of the bells ringing there in the holy place. Now people may say to you, and they may say to me even today, well, how do you know that your high priest, Jesus Christ, is really up there interceding for you. How do you know that he's still alive? How can you be sure? And all we have to say is just listen. Listen closely and you hear the harmonious ringing of the bells, so to speak, as you listen carefully to the working within the body, within the church, through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, as the people watch, listen, look, and they see the working of the Holy Spirit through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which are the word of wisdom, uh, word of knowledge, gift of faith, healings, miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, speaking of tongues, the interpretation of tongues. As you begin to watch and see the reality of the Spirit of Jesus Christ sounding forth within his body, the church, they will know that he's alive. And so as we look at these chapters, as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and then 1 Corinthians chapter 14. That is the operation of the gifts. But what about chapter 13? I mean, why is that there? We're told there in uh, Exodus chapter 39, verse 25 and 26, that as they made this garment that the high priest wore, as they attached these golden bells, solid gold bells, to the hem of his garment, between each bell was a pomegranate, and it was made of woven linen. Now, they put a fruit between the bells. Now, what is the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians chapter 5 tells us it's love. And so we see here in these chapters, we see chapter 12, the, the, uh, uh, telling us what the gifts of the Spirit are. We see in chapter 14 the, the proper uh, a manifestation of the Spirit, the working. We see here in chapter 13 a fruit in between those two bells, ringing bells, a fruit of love. Now, the church at Corinth was a clanging congregation. Although they were lacking in no spiritual gift, as Paul tells us here, they were lacking in one thing, and they were lacking in love. So when the Lord wants us to be as his body, as he's the high priest, he wants us to show the world that he's alive, ministering and interceding and moving and real. And the way he does that is through the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. When people would come into the church of Corinth, they would see total confusion. They would have a love feast. Say, oh, okay, everybody, we're going to have a what we call potluck, whatever you want, love, love pot or whatever you want to call it. Everybody be here at 5 o'clock and bring your, your dishes or whatever. Well, people would show up at 5 o'clock, and then those who would come at 7 o'clock, there'd be nothing left because everyone came early and ate it all up. There was confusion. There was anger between the people even. And so as Paul is talking about the gifts of the Spirit, there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the operation of the gifts, there in chapter 14. He puts a pomegranate, a fruit, the fruit of love, between those chapters to instruct us on how the best way to operate in those are. Chapter 13 puts a pomegranate there. And where the two chapters speak of the gifts, chapter 13 is a pomegranate of love. And it goes on to speak and to make those chapters ring out harmoniously. As you look at chapter 12, you look at chapter 14, they don't work together unless there's a chapter 13 there to show us, to instruct us on how to operate in those gifts, in the manifestation of those gifts. Now, let's start off with 
First, number one, why do we even need it in the first place? I mean, why do we need this love? Why, why can't we just, like I say, you do your thing, I'll do mine, you know, never the twain shall meet type of thing. I can work for the Lord, you can work for the Lord. Let's just not run into each other, not bump into each other. Well, why do we need it? Let's look at verse 1 of chapter 13. Paul says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Now the word agape there is what uh, I know some translations call it charity in the old King James. Uh, New King James here uh, calls it love if I don't have love. The love that it's talking about there is agape love. Now the English language uh, takes that word love. The Greek, of course, is more precise. We can say, or I can say, I, I love my wife. Tremendously, I agape my wife. I would do anything for my wife. That's the kind of love I have for her. I would do anything. But I can also say, you know what? I love my little dog, Sassy. And I can say, oh, you know what? I love steak. Or, you know what? I love hot dogs. I love barbecues. I love walks in the park. The English uh, translation of love, we use it so widely it's not really precise. The Greek language is very precise in what it says. There are four definitions of love in the Greek language. First, there's storge, S-T-O-R-G-E. And it's an affection, like the kind of affection I have for my little sassy. Okay? That's the kind of affection I have for my dog. Then there's eros, which is a physical or a sensual love. That's where we get our, our word uh, uh, erotic, in fact. Then there's phileo, which is brotherly love, where we get Philadelphia, uh, the city of brotherly love. And then there's agape. It's the love that gives just for the sake of giving. It's a whole different dimension of love. A love that gives and gives and gives without getting anything in return. Of course, the perfect example of that is Jesus Christ, or God the Father. How he loved us so much. And what did he ask in return? Nothing. Just accept his son. That's it. No, no working to, to get there, to, to earn his love. He just gives it unconditionally. Paul says, without it, you're nothing. Without this kind of agape love, you're nothing. You're just nothing but sounding brass and clanging cymbals. Oliver Cromwell uh, was a well-known British leader in the 16th century. He was a, uh, a very famous and successful general. He was also a very strong Christian. And he was putting himself in a, in a dilemma one time when one of his men had, had uh, run off. A couple of days later, they, they caught the man. They brought him uh, up for trial. And he was found guilty of desertion. And he was sentenced to be shot at the sound of the curfew bell, which was at 10 o'clock at night. So at five minutes to 10, soldiers went and they pulled this uh, man out of his cell. They tied his hands behind his back. And they, they took him to the firing squad. They set him there. At 10 o'clock, Cromwell gave the signal for the curfew bell to ring. And the, the guard pulled on the, on the rope, but there was no sound. And Com Cromwell went to the... To the uh, Sentry and said, what's the problem here? Well, they, after investigation, they found out that they had brought a, a young lady in front of Cromwell and, and said, you know, she had tied herself to the clapper of the bell. Further investigation showed that that was the, the uh, man's fiancée. Cromwell, Cromwell was so taken with the, the love that she had showed for him, the punishment that she had taken for him that he said that there would be no curfew bell rung that night. You see, where do you find that kind of love apart from Jesus Christ at the, at the cross of Calvary? Jesus climbed that hill. He was nailed to that cross to take the punishment that we all deserve. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's what agape is. No matter how fluent you may pray, no matter how golden your oratory may be, Paul says if you don't have this kind of love, all those things you do for the Lord, in the name of the Lord, are nothing. They don't amount to a hill of beans in God's economy. You can move in all the gifts of the Spirit found there in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You can also flow in the gifts that are recorded in Romans chapter 12. You can actually serve in one of the ministries that are presented to us in Ephesians chapter 4. But if you don't have love, it profits you nothing. It doesn't amount to a hill of beans. So why do we need it? Without it, everything we do for the Lord is null and void. It means nothing. Secondly, what is it? Now, 1 Corinthians is, is, uh, is going to explain to us, and it's going to take a little bit of time here. Hopefully we won't run too long because Brenda's doing the children's ministry and she might not show me the love that I desire when we get through here. So, <laughs> so what is love? Starting in, in verse 4, it says that love suffers long. Now, the Corinthians were impatient with one another. They would, didn't want to wait for one another. They were operating in gifts at the same time, causing confusion and strife. And there was a lot of uh, anger that was going on there. Love suffers long. It's like the ever-ready battery. It just keeps on suffering. The word suffer there is E-A-O, just the way it's spelled, E-A-O. And it means to let or to permit. So you let or permit these things to happen to you and you don't count it. Now, maybe Peter was trying to impress Jesus when he said, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Seven times? He probably thought Jesus was going to say, man, you are a long sufferer, my man. But he didn't say that. Jesus says, no, you need to forgive him 70 times seven. Now, that doesn't mean 490 times. That doesn't mean you can keep track and say, all right, that's 488. That's 489. That's 490. You're, I'm done with you. That's it. But that's not what it means. It means that you do not count. You just keep suffering and keep suffering. Keep allowing or keep permitting this to happen without taking it into account. That's what Jesus was saying. Agape love doesn't say, okay, that's enough. I've had it. No more. That's it. It just keeps suffering indefinitely. Verse 4 goes on to say that love is kind. Now, the word kind there means good and gracious. Or love reacts with goodness. Love is gracious toward those who mistreat it. Of course, what greater example of that is that in the scriptures when we see Jesus on the cross at Calvary saying, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Just forgive them, Lord. They're in, in Vienna, Virginia, not Austria. Vienna, Virginia, right here in the United States of America. There was a lawsuit that's been going on for years and years with the ALCU and the Christian community. Now, the ACLU was uh, up in arms because the Christian community wanted to have the nativity on the city hall lawn. So they went to court, and the judge uh, kind of made a... Uh, a compromise. He said that the Christians could indeed have their nativity there, but the Jews needed to be represented too, so they had to be menorah. And uh, uh, Kwanzaa had to be represented there. And of course, ACLU wanted Santa Claus and his reindeer there as well. So the Christians, they decided, okay, they, it's a compromise. But what they did is they kind of upset the ACLU when that Display was put up. There in the center of all of this confusion and stuff was the baby Jesus. Everything was surrounding and focusing on baby Jesus, which it should be. Well, the ACLU didn't think it was very funny for Santa to park his reindeers with the donkeys and the camels and bow down and worship Jesus there in the, on the city hall. So the ACLU took him back to court and... The judge finally decided, well, you know what? If that's what you're going to do, then you cannot have the nativity there anymore. So the next year, 
the Christians rented a lot across the street from City Hall, and they put their nativity there. And uh, they carried picket signs in front of City Hall, and uh, the news media, of course, got a hold of it. They sent cameras and uh, taking videos and pictures, and it was on the, the uh, evening news. And one of the signs that they caught and they broadcast was, the ACLU is just jealous because they don't have three wise men or a virgin in their whole group. Now, <laughs> be that as it may, that is not kind, okay? Love is to react with goodness toward those who mistreat it. I think in light of 1 Corinthians 13, uh, verse 4 there, we would be well to filter much of our well-meaning activism through the lens of agape, is it kind? Paul says agape love is long-suffering. And while it is suffering, it's kind. It's not bitter or cynical or cutting. goes on to say love does not envy. Okay, envy there is, it means a feeling of displeasure produced by the prosperity of others. Then in Philippians in, in uh, chapter two, 2, verse 5, Speaking of Jesus, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross." Love is not displeased at the success of others. Jesus didn't say, it's not fair for me to have to go down there. Send the Holy Spirit. Or, Dad, why don't you go? No. It's not displeased with the success of others. It does not envy. You don't say, oh, man, why did you get that promotion? Or why did you get the glory for that project? I mean, I'm the one that did all the work. Just because you're the boss, now you get all this, this extra uh, uh, accolades. No. Love does not envy. It reminds me of the story of Jonathan and David. There's a perfect example of not envying. Jonathan was next in line to become king of Israel. But yet David had been anointed by Samuel. What did Jonathan do? He said, that's not fair. I'm going to get rid of David. When his father Saul tried to get rid of him, but not Jonathan. Jonathan said, you know what? Good for you, David. I'm behind you 100%. That's what love does. It goes on to say, love does not parade, or the King James says, vaunt itself. It doesn't show off saying, watch how loving I can be. The root word in the Greek means as a windbag or a vain, glorious braggart, hyping oneself up. Love just goes behind the scenes and doesn't parade around looking for recognition. Sending out calendars at Christmas time, here I am in January, I'm on my knees and I'm praying for you. You see the picture there? Yeah, January 1st. That's me praying for you. February, here I am, I'm feeding the poor. Yes, that's a picture of me there. See me, Mother Teresa. March, here I am speaking with a tongue of men and angels. And then in April, here I am giving my body to be burned. Now, that's not what it is. Love does not parade around. It doesn't seek its own. It doesn't... Uh, Try to look better than it is. It also says it's not puffed up or it's not prideful. The word is phocio in the Greek. It means to blow up or to inflate like a tire, to blow a tire up or a balloon, to where it's so big it's almost ready to burst. Love's not puffed up. It's not prideful. Try to make yourself look better than you truly are. Maybe you go with a group somewhere and, and you guys are ministering and you come back and you tell all your friends, well, you know what I did? I mean, I'm the one that did that. Instead of saying, you know what, we are the Lord. It's not puffed up. In verse 5, it goes on to say, love does not behave rudely. The King James says, unseemingly. Unseemingly means disgracefully or to behave disorderly, to bring dishonor. So love does not behave rudely. You know, if it doesn't seem right, guys, it's probably not. I think of that 
group back in the 80s, and we're called the Children of God. Some of you may remember them. Uh, maybe not. Maybe I'm the only one that was around in the 80s. I don't know. But anyway, they had a way of, of uh, ministering, evangelizing that was really unseemly. And they called it flirty fishing. I don't know if any of you remember that or not. Of course, Jesus told us to be fishers of men. And so what this group would do is they would send their young ladies out to where the young men were. They would put them in these little skimpy bikinis and send them to the beach. And the girls would flirt with the guys. They would send them to bars. The girls would drink and dance with the guys. They would do anything just to get these young men to come to one of their meetings. They called it flirty fishing. It was unseemly. They say, well, we did it just because we have a love for the lost. Therefore, they would lay down their lives. They would do whatever it takes to get somebody into the kingdom of God. They say, that's not agape. That's behaving unseemly. And even nowadays, I I think of the Westboro Baptist Church. My goodness. Those people going around and and, uh, uh, picketing and, and doing things at soldiers' funerals in the name of God? I don't think so. It's rude. It's unseemly. It's immoral. It's not compromising, though. Another way to view this is that it's not weird. Now, there are those who, I mean, let's face it, they're just weird. There are Christians who are just weird. They think that by their weirdness, they're showing a love for God, a, a radical holiness because of the way they act. No, love is not weird. It's not unseemly. There's a mentality among some who think that they need to wear a sandwich board or carry a sign and and shout from a megaphone, I'm suffering for Jesus. People may think I'm I'm weird, but you know, it's just because I'm so radical for Jesus. No, that's not it. There in Isaiah chapter 42 verse 2 it says, speaking of Jesus, He will not cry out, nor raise His voice, nor cause His voice to be heard in the street. Jesus' ministry was not Weird. That's what we're to practice. That's what we're to uh, model our ministry after, is what Jesus Christ did. The people loved to be around Jesus. He was relatable. There was a warmth and a love and an honesty. They just loved to talk with him. They loved to listen to him. They watched him work and saw how he he helped people practically. The people loved him. The religious leaders are the ones that didn't like him. It seems like it's been changing uh, now. Now it's the people who see the Christians that think, man, that's, that guy's are weird. And why is it that every time there's a, a gathering of Christians, that the TV, TV camera always focuses in on the weirdest person carrying the weirdest sign, and they interview them to represent all the Christians that are there? Love does not behave rudely in an unseemly way, and it's not weird. It goes on to say, love does not seek its own, does not insist on its own way, and is not selfish. Which says, I, I, I'll love you if you'll love me. I'll love you if you'll do this for me. It reminds me of a, of a woman who was uh, married to a man. It was a very loveless relationship. The man was very exacting. He made a list of Ten commandments for his wife. First one, she had to be up by 6 o'clock every morning, feet on the ground. By 6.30 precisely every morning, his breakfast was to be cooked and placed on the table in front of him. As he left for work, she was to go in and she was to vacuum and dust and make the house immaculate. She was to do the laundry, do the ironing, hang his clothes up in the closet an inch apart, color coordinated. It went on and on and on. Well, eventually that man died. And this woman remarried. And she married a man that she loved tremendously. And he loved her as well. One day she was going through her dresser drawer. And she happened to find this list of the Ten Commandments from her former husband. And as she started reading each one of these commandments, get up at 6 o'clock, have my breakfast ready, she realized that she was doing every one of those commandments for her new husband, but for a different reason, because of the love she had for him. Love does not seek its own. It's not if you love me or if you do this. It's because I love you that I do this. Also say that it's not provoked. 
The word provoke there in the Greek means to stir up. This agape love is not stirred up, as we're going to see as we get down in your way. Perfect love agape is not provoked. Phileo is provoked. Eros is provoked. Storge is provoked, but not agape. Absolutely nothing in the world can provoke agape love. Jesus is a picture of love. God is love. You can't provoke that. You can't put that in your life. There's nothing you can do to possess that kind of love. And we're going to see here how you can, though, or how you can minister through that. It also goes on to say that it thinks no evil. Actually, what the word means is uh, morally or ethically evil to include emotions and passions as well. So it thinks no evil. It's not suspicious of people. It doesn't think the worst. You see something happen. Oh, uh, I know what's going to happen. I know what they're up to. It, that's not what it is. It thinks no evil. Agape love just trusts in God. Yeah, but I can't trust him. I can't trust her. You know what happened 10 years ago? I got to keep an eye on him. Well, why? Because when you have those kinds of feelings and that kind of an attitude, it's because you no longer believe that God is able to deal with that person or that situation. I believe in the God of Ananias and Sapphira. God can deal with that. I don't have to. I believe what's said in there in Hebrews in chapter 4, in verse 13. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Not they. They're going to give an account. We. Us. Me. I'm the one that's going to have to give an account for myself. And you're the one that's going to have to give an account for yourself. I believe God will work. And I believe that he chastens them, them whom he loves. I can't tell you how much God loves me. Because he has chastened me time and time again. I'm probably the most chastened person in this room. Because God loves me so much. But I can assure you that your sin will find you out. We really believed that, that God was in control of suspicion and jealousy. Gossip. But all would cease because we know that God will deal with them, not me. Faithfulness of the Father is a work to take care of matters, to judge righteously. So I don't have to think evil of people. It goes on to say, love rejoices not in iniquity. Literally, when bad things happen to other people, when unrighteousness or something uh, not being right happens to somebody else. How many times you see something happen to somebody, maybe an enemy of yours or maybe somebody you can be a little jealous of, and something happens, you think, all right, God's dealing with them. I'm glad he finally got to it, you know? I mean, they deserve it. You know what they did to me or you know what they've been doing? To other people? No. True love never rejoices when iniquity or problems or trouble happens to another person. We're told that uh, it rejoices in the truth. Of course, the truth there means something genuine, something true. And when, when they speaks of the pottery, when they would uh, uh, look at the pottery up in the light, if there was a crack, many times they would fill it with wax or something. Well, that wasn't true. That wasn't uh, uh, genuine. Psalm 51, 6 says that God desires truth. You ever think about, I wonder what God wants from me. What, is, what does he want me to do? He wants you to be truthful. That's what he wants. Psalm 91, 4 tells that it is our shield. When the fiery darts of the enemy come at you, truth is your shield. Tell the truth. If you don't tell the truth, if you tell a lie, you're going to have to tell another lie to cover up the lie you just told. It's always better just to be truthful, even when the truth hurts. There in Psalm 119, verses 142, it says, it's our law. God says, that's the law, man. You need to tell the truth, regardless of what the consequences are for you. Well, it goes on there in, in verse 7. 
Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And you may say, well, you know what, Greg? That kind of sounds like blind love. You know, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Come on. Let me tell you something. Agape love is not blind. Agape love sees more, but because love sees more, it chooses to see less. Agape love sees past the situation all the way to the cross of Calvary, the price that was paid for that person or that deed that they're involved with, and it does not take into account a wrong suffered. Love sees more. Love sees the fact that I can look at that person and say, Jesus died for that sin too. Therefore, I don't have to focus on that uh, um, sin that they're involved with or delve into that uh, person's background or personality unless it's for the purpose of restoring them, exalting them, blessing them, and helping them. If I'm willing to do what Jesus did with the disciples and get down and wash people's feet, I have no right to accuse people. There in Luke chapter 22, verse 24, we see that the, the 12 disciples, they're in the upper room. This is the last night with Jesus. You think, oh man, the things that I would ask him, you know, how I would love on him that last night if I, just, if I was there. What do the disciples do? They were arguing, who's the greatest? Which one of us is the greatest? And there in their midst was Jesus Christ. Under the table there were 12 or 24 stinking feet. And what did Jesus do? He just loved them. He got down and he washed their feet. If my attitude toward people is, you know what? They're sinners. They've got dirty feet. They're stinking. Just cut them off. Be done with it. And I'm not living in agape. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's move on. Verse 8 there. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now I see in the mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall, be, I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. These are some controversial verses right here. There are basically two camps there when it comes to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. First camp says, the Bible says when that which is perfect has come, then prophecy and, and tongues will, will pass away. Now, the Bible was, the first canonization of the Bible was then in about 170 A.D. We had basically pretty much the whole Bible. And by the year uh, 397 A.D., the Bible is what we have today. What they believe is when the Bible was presented to us, then this is what was perfect. And now that we don't need prophecies and we don't need tongues, so we're not going to operate in those gifts within our body because... Of course, we have the Bible, and the Bible is perfect, so we don't have to operate in those particular gifts. Well, I understand their thinking, but I can't really grasp it. The other camp is this. That which is perfect is not this written word. The written word is perfect, don't get me wrong. This is infallible. This is God's infallible word. But I believe what they're talking about here, when that which is perfect has come, they're talking about Jesus Christ and his second coming. And when he comes for the second time, there won't be need for prophecy anymore because it'll all be history. There won't be need for speaking in tongues because we will know just as we are known. Now, one of the problems that I think that, that the other camp might have is that it also says that knowledge will pass away. So, I don't know how, how that works. You can throw out the prophecy and you can throw out the tongues, but now we'll keep the knowledge. <laughs> to me, I think what that 
scripture actually means is, is that those things will pass away when Jesus Christ comes back the second time. And that's my interpretation of it. But filtering it through 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and this agape love, I say, you know what, love those people. I don't know if they're right or I don't know if they're wrong. Personally, I believe that God gave us the gifts of the Spirit to do just what he said they do. They glorify him. It's to edify the body, to build the body up. And you can't pick or choose one here or one there and say, we'll, we'll do this, but we're not going to do that. We'll do this, and we'll accept that, but we're not going to accept this. I think you take the Word of God at it's what it's made for. And that's, this is a total truth right here. And if Paul had any indication that, that tongues and, and prophecy were going to pass away, why didn't he tell us there in chapter 12 or chapter 14, hey, don't concentrate on these things. They're going to pass away anyway. Don't speak in tongues. Don't prophesy. Don't, you know, they're not going to be around anyway. But yet he goes on in chapter 14 to specifically pick those two gifts to expound on. Whatever camp you're in, God bless you and I love you. <laughs> so, I, I find life to be so much more enjoyable because I see the work of the cross increasingly more clear, clearly the older I get. I see people's sins are forgiven. I see the reality of the Holy Spirit in convicting them, not me. The promise of the Father being worked out, as Tim quotes so, so uh, readily, 1 John 1, 9, for God, I mean, excuse me, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Be sure your sins will find you out. In due season, if you choose not to listen to the Word and respond to the Spirit, you'll be exposed. That sin will track you down. I don't need to get upset with people or try to force them to change or to, to accept my way of thinking. But I can bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things through the love that God gives us because I know that all things are working together for good and love never fails. First, I mean, yeah, First John 4, 8 tells us that God is love. Now, a lot of people have said, you know what? If, if you want to really test this thing, take the word love out of there and put your own name in there and see, well, your love suffers long. Well, Greg suffers long. Well, you know what? I don't get past the first one there. And I never will. And to be honest with you, neither will you. The only person that can fulfill what this says is if you put the name Jesus in there. Your name will never fit. Jesus' name is the only one that will fit. So you think, well, why do we need it, number one? Well, because if we don't have it, we're, we're nothing but sounding brass, clashing cymbals, crashing into one another, irritating. What is it? Of course, we've gone through that. Love suffers long, it's kind, does not envy, does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity and rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. God never fails. Jesus never fails. I fail. I don't know about you. But every day I have something to be sorry for because I didn't do something right. But you know what? God is faithful. And when I do confess my sins, He forgives me and He cleanses me from all unrighteousness. Now, how in the world can we live in that kind of love? If I tell you, you can put your name there, but you're never going to live up to it. Only Jesus can do that. How can we live in that place of love? The kind of love that we've just read about there. There's only one way. And that is to let Jesus Christ live and love through you. He's the embodiment of the characteristics that we see here in 1 Corinthians. The last 
verse there, verse 13, it says, Now abide, faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. So we're to abide. You can't psych yourself up into this kind of love. It's the fruit of His Spirit in you. As I walk with the Lord, as I talk to the Lord, as I learn more about the Lord, His Spirit, His Holy Spirit, will produce these characteristics through me. Slowly, me slower than others, obviously, but as surely as I'm standing here, He will produce characteristics in your life if we abide. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. There in, in uh, John in chapter 15, in verse 4, Jesus says, Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Remember what Paul said there in the first three verses you're nothing if you don't have this love what does Jesus say here you can't do anything without me he's the embodiment of love we're to be branches what do branches do on a tree they, they just kind of hang in there you know branches on a vine they just kind of hang in there that's what we're to do stay connected to the vine and as I do that by spending time with the Lord by speaking to the Lord through prayer, by getting to know the Lord, by studying His Word, the fruit, the agape love that we just talked about will come into your life. It's not a struggle. I've never seen a fruit tree strain and struggle to produce fruit. Stand next to a tree and listen sometimes. You'll never hear them grunting and groaning, trying to produce fruit. What do they do? They just abide with the trunk. And the fruit comes. You say, okay, Greg, that, that sounds good. You see, the only way that that branch will ever bear fruit is if it stays connected to the trunk, to Jesus Christ. Then in due season, without any strain, without any struggle, but in a relaxed, beautiful, flowing manner, there will be fruit. There will be that love that's spoken of here. When you walk with the Lord, you talk to the Lord, you learn more about the Lord. This pomegranate that we see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, called love, will come as you continue to do just what you're doing right now, and that is abiding in Him, seeking His face. Let's pray. Lord, I thank You for this evening. And Lord, I pray that each one of us would, would be those who would abide in you, Lord. That we would seek your face, Lord, daily. Lord, that we would learn more about you. Lord, that we would talk to you as a father. Lord, that we would come to you with our struggles, Lord, and our, and our troubles. Lay them at your feet, Lord. And Lord, I pray as we do that, we would be able to show the grace and the mercy and the love that you've shown to everyone else. I pray you would show that through us to the world. Lord, I pray that as we have seen in these verses, Lord, that you would take, and Lord, that we would be used by you through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, Lord, ministering one to another and also to a lost and dying world. Lord, we thank you for this evening. I pray you go before us now in Jesus' name. Amen.